The perception of mental illness in the form of visual media has had a very complex and varied history. Usually, these storylines are told through a very dramatized, inaccurate, and sometimes romanticized way, which further creates negative stereotypes and perceptions of mental illnesses, psychiatric hospitals, medication, and therapists. What's most commonly seen in forms of media is mental illness being used in the horror or psychological thriller genre. Mental illnesses in these genres aren't anything new, as it's seen most famously in Alfred Hitchcock's 1960s Psycho. Throughout the years, this has become more common in films, and individuals with mental illnesses in horror-type films are usually seen as the villain, dangerous, or a harm to others. This categorization only serves to further stigmatize mental health, as well as individuals who are diagnosed with mental illness. Most of the time, the symptoms of mental illnesses are exaggerated for a film, which can further confuse the general public especially if they are only made aware of certain mental illnesses through visual mediums and have no connection with an actual person who has a mental illness. This narrative can be seen in the 2016 film Split. Before Split was released, there were already articles that discussed the fact that Dissociative Identity Disorder, or DID, was being misrepresented in this film. DID is a disorder in which an individual has at least two distinct personality identities. In Split, Kevin, played by James McAvoy, is diagnosed with DID, and off the bat is already labeled as someone who is dangerous. In the beginning of the film, Kevin attacks and kidnaps a group of teenage girls, who he then keeps hidden in an underground cell. The film does accurately state that DID can be caused from childhood trauma, which is a point that Kevin discusses with his therapist. But the movie exaggerates the extent to which an individual with DID will display their alters, by displaying one of Kevin's alters as a subhuman character. In an article, Megan Benham states, while some studies show that body chemistry can change of personalities, the need for glasses and changing candidness have been reported. Split takes this much further. Kevin crawls on walls and the beast looms over the movie. The changing of the physical in Split represents McAvoy's character as monstrous and coupled with his incredibly violent and dangerous actions, the film only increases stigma around mental illness. I found an article stating that M. Night Shyamala was going to speak to a clinical psychologist, Bethany Brand, to learn more about DID. Shyamala stated that he and Universal Pictures were interested in promoting information and support with those of DID, and wanted to raise awareness for the disorder, but did not keep with his promises. DID is already a rare disorder and one that is drastically misunderstood in the media and even the psychiatric field. The movie only further emphasizes perception and also portrayed an individual with DID as being dangerous and violent. Looking at 2019's Midsummer opening scene, it's revealed that Danny's sister, Terry, is bipolar and commits a murder-suicide of herself and their parents. Since Terry is an off-screen character, little information is known about her, other than the fact that she's Danny's sister and has a mental illness. The addition of Terry being bipolar was mainly added as a shock value, and was a completely unnecessary and odd way to normalize Terry's behavior. Ari Aster might leave some viewers with the impression that people who are bipolar are extremely violent. The film also touches on Danny's struggles with anxiety, but Aster doesn't villainize Danny's mental health in the same vein as her sister. The most talked about and controversial movie that used this trope is last year's Joker. Now, I'm not someone who's super into comics, so I can only go off of the Joker performances that I've seen on the big screen. Taking a look into these iconic Joker performances, uh, not this one. But one thing that I noticed about Heath Ledger's performance is that, yes, he was antisocial, but most movie villains are. It wasn't in any way expressed or even hinted that he was murdering citizens and committing destructive acts due to any mental illness. My problem with Joaquin's Phoenix Joker is that it explicitly states that the Joker is committing these destructive acts because he has a mental illness. How about another joke, Murray? No, I think we've had enough of your jokes. What do you get? I don't think so. When you cross I think a mentally ill loner with a it. society that abandons him and treats him like trash! One could say that the Joker was bound to snap, as he does not have social support, has had his mental health stigmatized, and no longer has access to his social worker or medication due to budget cuts. Although I understand the direction in which the movie was supposed to go, I don't agree with the way Todd Phillips went about explaining this message. Phillips ended up creating a disorganized, insensitive, and inaccurate portrayal of mental illness, as well as making a false connection between mental illness and violence. In an article, Kelly Agram states, Every aspect of flex neurotypicality is stigmatized. 
coded as a reason to be suspicious of him and used as pretext for his descent into violence. The film even explains Joker's characteristic fits of laughter, historically seen as a symbol of his devilishness, of the delight he takes in cruelty, as the symptom of a condition. Here, it's an uncontrollable response to stress, similar to Tourette syndrome. Rather than effectively advocating for mental health resources, Joker plainly tells us to be wary of people who exhibit symptoms of mental illness. In our general media, there's a perception that those who are struggling with their mental health or are diagnosed with mental illness are at the forefront of those who commit violent and often deadly attacks. This can be seen in how news anchors and politicians report on mass shootings in America. One of the things we've learned from these shootings is that often underneath this is a diagnosis of mental illness. A lot of it is this mental illness and of the failings of mental health care. This isn't a guns situation. I mean, we could go into it, but it's a little bit soon to go into it. But uh, this is a mental health problem at the highest level. Movies like Midsummer, Split, Joker, and countless others only reinforce the untrue narrative that individuals with mental illnesses are automatically violent, dangerous, and a harm to society. In actuality, individuals with mental illnesses are no more likely to be violent than anyone else. Most people with mental illness are not violent and only 3-5% to of violent acts can be attributed to individuals living with a serious mental illness. In fact, people with severe mental illnesses are over 10 times more likely to be victims of violent crime than the general population. Some TV shows and films do a great job at displaying mental illnesses in an empathetic, realistic, and compassionate way, both in the psychological thriller genre and others. One of my favorite Netflix series, Bojack Horseman, is a show that I think expresses depression in the most realistic way. There are other movies that address the more common symptoms of depression, and ones that are most normalized and seen in the media, such as not wanting to get out of bed and extreme sadness. But Bojack Horseman takes it to the next level in Season 4, Episode 6, in which an entire episode is dedicated to Bojack's depression and how his perception of himself has changed due to his mental illness. It depicts the internal struggle one has with depression, the self-loathing and intrusive thoughts. Of course, there is no right way to be depressed or to show your feelings of depression. But this was a form of media that I feel like has expressed another side of depression that other forms of media have not yet shown. Sharp Objects is a 2018 HBO limited series that addresses a range of mental illnesses. In the series, Amy Adams plays a detective who returns to her hometown to solve a murder case. The show itself is classified as a psychological thriller, but it doesn't fall under the mental illness as horror trope. Instead, the psychological thriller label is more reserved for the situations that occur in her small town. Adam's characters and others in the show are depicted as people first and don't have their mental illnesses exploited. I do have to put a warning and say that the show explicitly shows self-harm, self-harm scars, and scenes of suicide, so one should watch the show at their own discretion. The Perks of Being a Wallflower is also an excellent portrayal at the way that trauma leaves a lasting impact on an individual, as well as shedding a light on anxiety and depression in males. Yes, the script and characters at times can be corny, but the overall message is one that is truly a positive one. Throughout the film, Charlie finds his support group, gains connections with people he can engage in candid conversations with, and consistently takes his medication which is something that is hardly seen in movies about mental illness. Charlie isn't fixed, and at one point he has a setback in his journey. But I honestly think it just shows a realistic aspect of things. Just because you take the steps and necessary treatments into getting better doesn't mean you won't face any challenges ever in your life. It just means you found a different way to cope with your mental illness and have resources to aid you when things do get challenging. I am aware that this is Hollywood and that more dramatic versions of stories perform better critically and in the box office, but I really think it's up to individuals who create and produce films to truly educate themselves and use resources at hand to tell an accurate portrayal of mental illness. For some film watchers, it might be easy to ignore negative depictions of groups of marginalized people and to enjoy a film for what is being shown at face value but I think we owe it to ourselves to be more critical of the media that one consumes, especially when it can negatively affect a group that has already faced an extensive amount of discrimination and stigmatization. If you're looking for resources, I really recommend the YouTube channel Special Books by Special Kids. 
I've been watching this channel for a while, but the host of the series, Chris, interviews individuals from the neurodiverse community. He has a playlist on his channel called Meet Someone with a Mental Health Disorder, and where you can watch interviews from individuals who are diagnosed with different mental illnesses. My hope for the future is that the media takes the time to thoroughly research these mental illnesses and to portray them with the care, compassion, and empathy that is rightly deserved.